Good morning and welcome. My name is Sarah Lindsay and I am the minister here at the Unitarian Society of Ridgewood. As always, a big thank you to the entire team that helps bring services to life each Sunday. For over a century, the Unitarian Society of Ridgewood has been gathering in community as a home for liberal faith and free thinking. Now, as much as ever, we need communities like ours that believe in the interdependence of humanity in the power of love, and in the holy spark in every single person. Here in this community, we celebrate each person, whatever their gender, sexual orientation, age, education, history, race, ethnicity, economic status, physical or mental health, or theology. If this is your first time visiting one of our Sunday services, we are so glad you found us this morning and a special welcome to you. Please consider staying for our virtual coffee hour. It's a great way to connect with smaller groups of folks. If you'd like to learn more about us, please fill out the Google form that's going to be dropped into the chat box. Or you can always, <clears throat> you can always email our office at 113cottage at gmail.com or visit our website, uuridgewood.org. If you've been with us for a while and you're curious about membership or if you feel ready to take the next steps toward it, please contact Ann Peretti, our congregational administrator at usr.membership1 at gmail.com. We'll put that into the chat as well. A quick reminder that this month on Reed Porch, we are collecting food bags. There are three different options of food bags that you can donate that are going to then be distributed through the Women's Club of Ridgewood. Please check the e-blast from February 5th or just contact the office or any of um, the folks in leadership and we can remind you what those three bags, what that means. Um, please help as we're trying to do our part to ease food insecurity in our area in these difficult times. Then please also remember that we are continuing to have our conversations on Tuesday at 7.30 about the topic um, of today and how we address it with children. That Tuesday night conversation is open only to folks who are caregivers of or primary influences on children and youth. Um, and that's at 7.30, it'll be in the morning e-blast, a link to the Zoom room. That's it for announcements this morning. We are so glad that you are choosing to spend your Sunday morning with us. Please join us in the words for lighting the chalice. They can be found on your screen. We light this chalice for the light of truth, the warmth of love, and the energy of action as we gather together in the circle of community. Now take a deep breath and listen. After the snow has fallen and the earth has quieted, the noise begins anew. The chirp of bright red birds move from icy branch to icy branch. The children's giggles and screams on sleds that whiz by. The scrape and scuff of the plows and the shovels on the hard ground. And the crunch, crunch, crunch of our feet moving us through the winter. Though it gives way to life and noise, the snow brings a quiet, a time for reflection and for contemplation of what matters most in these two brief lives of ours. We bring that same quiet to our hearts and minds and souls and bodies this morning, a quiet for contemplation, reflection, witnessing, care, a quiet that we cultivate within ourselves and for each other. Take a deep breath and listen to this sound that calls you to stillness and silence. Breathe and listen.
To open our service, I offer you this poem by Shara Leslie titled, On Faith. There is no map for how the apples fall. The tree feels nothing letting go. Along the crumbling wall that holds the sun-baked orchard, shadows ease their way. There is no map for how the apples fall. Silence in the house. The tree sees <clears throat> nothing looking out. Let's go. I'm more at ease among shadows than the wall of sun stalled above the house. I hold the orchard, its walls, this silence. Seasonal, it comes and goes, easing itself back into shadows. There's sweetness in the crumbling, letting go, the how and why. This sun-baked nothingness I feel that comes, goes. What's sweet is sweet in so many varieties, becomes nothing after all. A wall is just a wall in wind or rain. A tree, a tree. Silence in the house. The apples fall. There is no map for how. We are living through losses great and small. And in truth, we always do. There's no roadmap for how to live through them. But today, we will explore what it means to experience loss and how we can love ourselves and each other through challenging times out to the other side. Thank you for spending this time with us. It is good to be with you. Good morning. As you know, this month we are exploring the challenge of love through the lens of the body, sex, loss, and country. And today we continue our journey on the challenges of love by exploring loss. We are but a day or two away from a grim milestone, 500,000 deaths from COVID-19 pandemic. How are we as a collective body how are we to endure such loss? How are we to support, protect, and teach our children and youth to bear loss? Loss not only encompasses illness and death, but separation, separation from social contact, from routines, from physical contact, from community, for children and youth, they are coping with the results of detaching learning from a live teacher and their class community. Being exposed to suffering and struggling to identify their feelings. A few years ago, I experienced a loss that was so profound, a death in my family that I did not think I could recover from it. I was wild with grief and felt unmoored and the pain was unbelievable. It was unbearable. After meeting with a wise and gifted counselor, something began to shift. The unbearable became bearable. It became a working pain. Somehow over time, I knew that this loss would ultimately and paradoxically contribute to my wholeness. Dr. Bernie Siegel, pediatric surgeon and mystic wrote, one cannot get through life without pain. What we can do is to choose how to use the pain life presents us. Life is a labor pain. We are here to give birth to ourself. So we turn once again to our children and youth. Laura Phillips, neuropsychologist and the director of the Child Mind Institute, sees a mental health care crisis and offers coping strategies for our children and youth. They include things that we already know, but we may need to implement. 
sticking to a daily routine, making physical activity a daily priority, making time if possible for socially distanced or Zoom play dates. When outbursts occur, validate those feelings, limit exposure to news, and invite them to play music and create art to be present to the moment. And do remember that parent self-care is child care. So we invite you to explore these coping strategies this coming Tuesday at 7.30 with our series, How to Talk to Your Children about body image, sex, loss, and country for parents, grandparents, and caretakers as we share challenges and wisdom with each other. Reverend Sarah will be facilitating the discussion and we hope you will join us. As we approach 500,000 COVID deaths, there will be a resource available to you from religious education, a comprehensive digital collection, family resources for separation, grief and healing during the pandemic. These materials will help nurture connection, understanding and healing, especially we, when we cannot be together in person. We are reminded by Rabbi Steve Leader, author of The Beauty of What Remains, that loss, separation and grief are great teachers. If we are open to what they reveal in the ordinary, quote, good is really great and a little is a lot. Blessed be. Every Sunday that we gather, we ask for an offering to support the work of this congregation. Our mission here at the Unitarian Society of Ridgewood is to grow in mind and spirit, to act with love for justice and to transform ourselves and the world. This work never stops and it is work that must be supported by our time, our talents and our financial commitments. Thank you for being part of this community, for bringing your open hearts and open minds along with your helping hands and your generous offerings. You make this community what it is and you ensure that the work of this congregation can continue for generations to come. On your screen, you'll see instructions on how to give. Every contribution helps us create a more welcoming and better world for all. Please give generously. The offering will now be given and gratefully received.
This morning, our first reading is a video, um, but for folks who are on the phone, I'm going to read the text of the video. It's a poem by Dan Albergati titled Things to Do in the Belly of the Whale, and it's animated by Pearl Taylor. Things to do in the belly of the whale by Dan Albergati. Animated by Pearl. Measure the walls. Count the ribs. Notch the long days. Look up for blue sky through the spout. Make small fires with the broken hulls of fishing boats. Practice smoke signals. Call old friends and listen for echoes of distant voices. Organize your calendar. Dream of the beach. Look each way for the dim glow of light. Work on your reports. Review each of your life's 10 million choices. Endure moments of self-loathing. Find the evidence of those before you. Destroy it. Try to be very quiet and listen for the sound of gears and moving water. Listen for the sound of your heart. Be thankful that you are here, swallowed with all hope, where you can rest and wait. Be nostalgic. Think of all the things you did and could have done. Remember treading water in the center of the still night sea, your toes pointing again and again down, down into the black depths. Take a deep breath. Join me now in our time for quiet, for contemplation, for prayer, and for meditation. Find as comfortable a position for your body as you can and breathe in deeply through your nose and out slowly through your mouth. Breathe deeply and listen for the sound of your heart. 
There is no road map here in the belly of the whale, in the thick of a life. So just breathe. This morning, as we witness to the world's pain and to our own, we sit with the horrifying milestone of 500,000 American lives lost, and so many more around the world. We sit with the griefs and pains and losses of our own lives and of folks around the world. Lost time, lost fun, lost lives, lost loves. We breathe in deeply, mindful of the sorrow that can overwhelm us. Breathe slowly, breathe deeply, be here now. This morning, as we witness to the world's pain and to our own, we sit with hearts filled with gratitude for the beauty that still surrounds us. Sunshine glinting on snow, the earth moving ever on, the smiles of beloveds and the sweet taste of chocolate, all the little joys that still abound. We breathe in deeply, mindful of this world's deliciousness that can sustain us. Breathe slowly, breathe deeply, be here now. Spirit of life and love, we give thanks for the turning of our lives, for the complex nature of our human existence, for the simplicity of loving openly, for the grace and terror of time, for the hope in each new dawn. We breathe afraid, joyful, grateful, human and filled with love. May we hold our sorrow lightly. May we embrace our joy wholeheartedly and may we spread love generously. So may it be and amen. Please join us in singing our hymn, There is More Love Somewhere, number 95.
Our second reading is the poem, When I Am in the Kitchen by Jean Marie Beaumont. I think about the past. I empty the ice cube trays, crack, crack, cracking like bones. And I think of decades of ice cubes and of John Cheever, of Anne Sexton making cocktails, of decades of cocktail parties. And it feels suddenly far too lonely at my counter. Although I have on hooks nearby the embroidered apron of my friend's grandmother and one my mother made for me for Christmas 30 years ago with gingham I had coveted through my childhood. In my kitchen, I wield my great aunt's sturdy black handled soup ladle and spatula. And when I pull out the drawer, like one in a morgue, I visit the silverware of my husband's grandparents. We never met, but I place this in my mouth every day and keep it polished out of duty. In the cabinets, I find my godmother's teapot, my mother's Cambridge glass goblets, my mother-in-law's Franciscan plates. And here is the cutting board my first husband parqueted and two potholders I wove in grade school. Oh, the past is too much with me in the kitchen where I open the vintage metal recipe box Robin's egg blue in its interior to uncover the card for waffles, writ in my father's hand, reaching out from the grave to guide me from the beginning, sift and mix dry ingredients with his note that this makes three waffles in our large pan. And around that, an unbearable stain of egg yolk or melted butter that once defined a world. Despite a doer exterior, Rachmaninoff was a man of strong and deep emotions. This achingly beautiful song is saturated with a feeling of loss and regret. Oh. <laughs> the words to this poem, Oh, never sing to me again the songs of Georgia. Their tones recall to me in vain far distant shores with sorrow laden. Alas, those songs remembrance stir, full many memories round me gather. The steps at night, in vision clear, the form and features of another. This image, fatal yet so true, at sight of thee will surely vanish. But at thy voice to rise anew, that all my striving fails to banish. So never sing to me again these songs of Georgia, fair maiden. Their tones recall to me in vain far distant shores with sorrow laden. <laughs>
Yesterday, the boys and I took a walk around our little island. It isn't big, not even a quarter mile wide and just shy of two miles long. From almost any spot, you can see water. I've always had trouble living anywhere landlocked. Maybe it's from growing up surrounded by water. Maybe it's the Norwegian DNA swimming in my veins. Maybe it's some latent fear of being trapped in one place for too long. I don't know, but I need to know the water is there for my heart to feel at ease. Anyone who has lived near water, be it a river, a lake, the ocean, knows that water has many lessons to teach us. Our water, the East River, is technically a tidal estuary. It's only 16 miles connecting Upper New York Bay and the Long Island Sound. And being a tidal estuary, the direction of the river changes often. The depth changes frequently, exposing the rocks of the seawall or creeping high enough that you think you might be able to touch it if you just reached out. There's almost always traffic on the East River, especially now that the ferries go round and round enormous barges carrying unknown goods, smaller boats, tugs, police and fire boats, and in summer, jet skis, sailboats, motorboats. If you sit beside the river for just a little while, you are guaranteed some interesting human invention will pass by. But there's more than that for those who want to look. 
The seagulls swarm around the posts of the river railings, swinging their bodies out over the water in search of food. And the ducks, paddlings of ducks. I learned this week a group of ducks can be called a raft or a team or a paddling. If you sit beside the river, you can watch the paddlings of ducks as they navigate their watery home. And yesterday, as we walked, I saw a paddling of ducks just floating in whatever normal formation they adopt. Nothing looked strange. They just sat there on the water. But when you're a duck, just sitting there doesn't really mean much. Not for the first time, I marveled at the way moving water is never the same. As the ducks floated, along came wake from a ferry headed north. The ducks didn't move. The water rolled beneath them, they rode the waves. And while they ended up in a different place than they had been in when the wake first came, they were no worse for the wear. Ducks are made for water. The water is made to shift. In any moment, the river is different than it was the second before. Now I realize that ducks of course don't conceive of it this way, but as I watched, I thought about how being at the mercy of the changing waters, they inevitably lost, lost position, lost possibly food, but they didn't lose each other. The paddling stayed together as they rode that waving wake. We have faced changing waters for the last 12 months. We mentioned earlier that 500,000 milestone. Some data aggregators say we haven't quite hit it. Others say we have passed it already. And honestly, it doesn't matter if it happened the other day or if it will happen in the next two days. The magnitude of the loss of life we have experienced is staggering. The number of kitchens the world over that now hold such abundant memories is hard to fathom. And for me, at least, as we approach that year long anniversary, I find myself somewhat unmoored. I am irritable. I am too hard on my children who are also going through traumatic loss after loss. I feel unmotivated and tired and sleeping is a challenge even though I'm tired all the time. I feel antsy in my own skin and if it snows one more time, I share this because I suspect I'm not the only one. A tough and cold winter is challenging under the best of circumstances, but add prolonged and sustained grief on top of it, and you have a recipe for irritability and misery and fatigue. We have all known hard winters, but for most of us here in our privileged nation, prolonged grief is not something we have had to endure. The prolonged grief we're in the midst of isn't just about those 500,000 lives lost though. And I think this is important to say, along with those great losses through death have come lots of other losses. Birthdays without parties, graduations online, weddings postponed, a million hugs thwarted, last I love you's stolen, friendships put on hold, the list goes on and on. 12 months of life on pause have given every last one of us cause to grieve because we are confronting daily our awareness of time passing. I've been thinking a lot lately about how life is kind of always like this. It's just usually so much more protracted. A missed milestone here or there or a lost friendship once a decade, but we're compressing into this tight time frame losses through death or otherwise that might normally happen across years. And we're experiencing them side by side, all struggling at the same time, rather than taking turns in our grief, as is so often and blessedly possible in normal times. Although we tend to reserve the words for the ending of a life, our human lives are in truth filled over and over with loss and grief. A million little cuts, if you will. 
I think I shared with you all the story of sitting with my father at our dining room table one day as we watched the kids play. Without looking at me, he said, I wish I would be here to see who they are as grown-ups." My father and I are very similar. We are the types that live with a certain kind of melancholia below all else, a deep knowing of the ways that life will be lost to us. Deep knowledge of our finitude brings sorrow. This past Christmas, one of my children articulated how challenging it is to feel his own childhood passing, the loss of certain kinds of magic, growing up and being aware of how time moves and what is gone forever. He is definitely my child, longing to grow up and already nostalgic for what was when he was small. The passing of our childhood, the passing of our lives can bring sorrow. Recently, I've been so aware of my younger children, the way that they can still leap into my arms, the way they still slip their hands into mine. And I have been painfully aware that one day, not too long from now, I won't be able to lift them anymore. We won't know until it has already happened. We won't be able to memorialize that last time they cling to me like a baby koala. The loss of certain ways of relating to each other brings sorrow. As I approach 40, I've also been thinking about the great losses of my own life. Less the deaths of beloveds, though certainly there have been those. More the loss of dreams or hopes or possibilities. I have a wonderful life, but there are emptinesses as there are in any life. Dreams unfulfilled, passions unexplored. The what ifs, the what might have beens, the I wishes that we still cling to bring sorrow. Our lives are not joy interrupted by the singular horror of death. They are a constant dance between the grace and the terror of time. We all know this. We push those feelings to the side. We hold the melancholy and nostalgia at bay, perhaps tearing up at a song or a book, but generally attempting to reserve our grief for the big losses that we publicly acknowledge. I have many thoughts about why we do this, why we discredit the small griefs of a lifetime. I think we've overvalorized strength and undervalued vulnerability probably in order to create a society of doing and making and creating and progress rather than one of wholeness and living. When we ignore and deny the minor losses, we enable treating each other more harshly, treating our fellow stardust travelers as commodity or product rather than as whole spiritual beloved humans whose hearts we adore. And I think it has become habit culturally ingrained, less a matter of conscious thought and more a, this is how it is. But when we do this, we don't acknowledge those little and medium losses, when we discredit the very real grief that happens with everyday living rather than just with deaths, well, then we deny our own wholeness and we lose an opportunity. In Unitarian Universalism, we dedicate babies. We don't bless them to remove original sin. We simply bless them for the people they will become. And when I dedicate babies, <clears throat> I touch different parts of their bodies with a flower and speak a prayer for that part of them. Their hands that will work for justice, a mouth that will speak the truth with compassion. And the last thing I do is I touch the flower to their heart and I say, may you know the full range of human emotions but above all, may you feel abundant love given and received throughout the days of your life. And the words aren't just words. We feel such a range, us humans. Sometimes it overwhelms us, but that range, it brings us into deeper knowledge of ourselves and of others. It increases our empathy, our ability to live compassionately and generously in the world. And it also helps us increase the love that moves through the world. Love for ourselves and for others, love for these lives of ours. In the face of loss and pain, sorrow and suffering, truly what we have is love. 
love given and received. My oldest has asked a few times about death, not what death will feel like, but what mourning will feel like, what grieving will feel like. He's asked how life goes on when the person you love most in the world dies. He's asked me how you move through. The same question is true of every loss. How do we move past that miscarriage, that divorce, that job loss, that dream deferred or denied? How do we move past loneliness we never thought we would feel? How do we move past isolation and deep longing for moments we can never recover? How do we move past the passage of time? How do we keep going in spite of the human reality of loss and longing? How do we live from the belly of the whale? When we're in the belly of the whale surrounded by pain, it can be hard to remember that there is more, more beyond the loss. Even harder perhaps to remember that there are people who love us beyond that belly. When that rolling, moving water freezes over and it feels like all we know is hardship in the depth of winter, it can be hard to remember that below that fragile ice shelf is moving water ready to bring change again, and that all around us, our paddling of fellow ducks remains. The answer to my son's questions, I believe, are not substantially different in normal times or in pandemic times. How we move is by love. And please know that I realize there is a difference between normal times and pandemic times. Isolation is that difference, and it is very real. We can't look around as easily and find our ducks. There's no manual, no roadmap, no particular way to hold our sorrow that will fix it all, not before COVID, not during, and not after. But I think, I really do think, that cultivating love is the best shot we have to live our lives as fully and joyfully as we can. We love. We love in spite of. We love anyway. We love through. We love beyond. That's what I tell my children. We don't let loss scare us out of loving. Loving ourselves enough to dream of our future, loving each other enough to risk and be vulnerable and care for one another, loving the world enough to fight for it, loving life enough to live it every day, every moment. And what does that mean? When we feel beaten down, alone, there are steps we can take. We can offer ourselves love, love ourselves enough to do our best to treat our bodies gently. Good food, baths, showers, enough sleep, exercise, our favorite TV show. And love our whole selves enough to cut ourselves some slack. Maybe the vacuuming or that phone call can wait one more day. Maybe that extra brownie is exactly what you need. Especially now in the isolation of pandemic living, holding ourselves with loving care is so vital. And then we love others enough to trust them with our vulnerability and our struggle. We send that text or that email or make that call that says, I am in the belly and I need my ducks. It may be enough to send out that message that says, I'm feeling down and broken and I can't see the world through the spout right now. Just remind me that you're there. Maybe we need something more than that, but we have to ask, make those fires and send out those smoke signals and ask. And then we have to love each other enough to answer. We can bring ourselves to presence and mindfulness in the world and remember how much we love it. Spend a moment looking at the way the ice coats the branches. Listen to a piece of music that swells and quiets in just the right ways to match our mood. Walk out in the silent snow. We have to find ways to remember that the world is still with us, still out there in its glory and beauty, awaiting our work to keep it whole and to make it better. And then we have to embrace the reality of our living. So much sorrow exists between our expectation of constant joy and the truth of human experience. When we remember that life comes in measures, that all things path, pass, that beneath the frozen is moving water and all things will thaw. When we remember too 
how brief our time can be, we can remind ourselves that to live life fully is to love it in its fullness, loving even the hard parts. So love on, friends. Don't deny the sorrows and the losses and the griefs. Let yourself feel them and then love on in spite of them. Love on because of them. Bring those pains into your understanding of yourself and your story. Share them with your trusted paddling of ducks and then keep right on living and loving forward. We can do it. I know we can. Please join us in our hymn, I Know I Can, number 1015. for extinguishing the chalice. They can be found on your screen. We extinguish the flame, but may the light of truth, the warmth of love, and the energy of action burn bright in our hearts until we are together again. May you know the full range of human emotions. But above all, may you feel abundant love given and received throughout the days of your life. So may it be. Thank you for being with us this morning. We will take a couple of minutes and then go into our coffee hour rooms. I'm gonna, uns oh, Les, will you unspotlight me please? And I will change the settings so everyone can unmute themselves and say good morning. Okay, that should do it. Hi everyone, I'm just jumping in here. Next week, Reverend Sarah will not be preaching. We will have a guest, but um, something very special is going to happen next uh, Sunday. It's Reverend Sarah's birthday. So I think that we need to sing to her this week. Oh my God. So please, please everybody, <laughs> let's Me go. Too. Happy birthday. 
birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Sarah. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Sarah. And many, many more. Thank you, many, many more.